So now it's 11.30 and I'm uh, very happy to welcome Kristin Ovitsland, Eivor Andersen and Ragnhild uh, Sorgate. Oftestad. Now I, I chose the middle name uh, Eivor, but I should say Oftestad as well, of course. It's a great pleasure to have you all here. Uh, and many of us uh, have heard about the Jerusalem project for several years, and we have been deeply impressed by the work that you've done. And even more impressed when we see the three volume that you have edited, that is just fresh from the press. And today uh, you will share some of your insights and reflections with regard to the uh, Jerusalem project. And uh, we're very happy to have all three of you here. Uh, we have 15 minutes where you share your insights and then it's open uh, for the uh, participants to raise their questions and comments in the Q&A. And um, yeah, would you like to share a screen or uh, yeah, I'm sharing yeah. my screen now. Perfect. So the floor is yours. Um, yeah. Do you see? Uh, am I screen screen sharing now? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, I'll start. Thank you, Iselin. Um, uh, just to, to say that this is. Uh, actually, this presentation today is actually not a proper book launch. Uh, because that will happen uh, online next Tuesday at 3.15 uh, p.m., as you see um, from this announcement at the uh, MFCaster's webpage. And we hope that many of you log on for this event too. Uh, yeah, because then we will talk more about our books and what's in them. But uh, today uh, we wish to discuss or to reflect on on some issues regarding our research project as a whole, some afterthoughts uh, on, uh, on working collaboratively as we have done, uh, and some reflections on also on the relevance of our results. Uh, so we wish to share that with you. Uh, and I will start by saying a few words about the Jerusalem Code, uh, this notion that you find in the titles of, um, uh, of our books. Um, I'm sorry about this because I'm, I'm uh, working with two screens and it doesn't work properly and I should have, yeah. <laughs> this was clumsy. Um, so here's, uh, here's our, uh, our books uh, uh, and their title is uh, Tracing the Jerusalem Code. So what is, what is it about this Jerusalem Code, this notion? Uh, uh, so um, uh, because that has been uh, at the same time our object of investigation, we have studied and researched the Jerusalem Code uh, and at the same time, it has also been our main analytical concept. Uh, and uh, recognizing how evasive and multivalent uh, uh, the biblical cluster of metaphors about the holy city of Jerusalem has been uh, in cultures uh, affected by Christianity. Uh, we found that this term code was able to capture the pervasiveness and the complexity of Jerusalem interpretations um, across historical periods and uh, across different media also. Uh, we understand code in semiotic terms as a framework of convention with certain words or notion that make sense in a certain way within this frame. And in a culture from familiar to this biblical cluster of metaphors connected to, um, to that city, Jerusalem is uh, an organizing principle that enables meaning production. 
that is how we, we think of the Jerusalem code and to investigate the application of uh, Jerusalem related metaphors in texts and images and architecture and rituals and even more things and to explore how these applications interconnect and produce and generate meaning and affect people's lives. Uh, this is to trace the Jerusalem code. And this way of thinking, uh, we experienced that that had an immediate appeal on us in the project, but also on everyone we tried to explain our project to. Uh, Bianca Kuhnel, who is the grand old lady of Jerusalem reception studies in, in, uh, in the world, <laughs> she, she found that, uh, that concept of a Jerusalem code very clever, she remarked at a, uh, an international conference uh, at an early stage in which we, uh, we, we presented our project. Uh, so it seemed in intuitively true that there really is such a thing as a Jerusalem code. However, and that is rather interesting, I, I find, as we worked our ways into our material, it proved rather challenging to define our code concept uh, precisely and to make it uh, into an operative analytical tool. At a point, uh, we all, we members, core members of the project uh, uh, sat down uh, to write down our uh, own individual interpretations of definitions of the Jerusalem code. Um, uh, and, and they were not in any way agreement about how to delimit this concept and to, to apply it. Uh, in the end, I think we managed quite well uh, to reach an agreement uh, and to make the code operative and working analytically but it certainly required very hard work and what we may also call the kind of disciplinary generosity uh, from all of us to, to reach that kind of uh, operative agreement. Uh, so the task we had given ourselves transcended several academic demarcation lines, uh, his, like historical periods and conventional disciplines with diverse methods and also types of sources because we were, have worked across, um, across a, a wide, wide range of sources that are normally treated separately, texts and images and material sources. Uh, so I think that is the main reason why we struggled so with our main concept. And I think perhaps Rangnil would like to say something more about that. Thank you, Christine. Um, thank you, Islin, for the introduction first. Uh, I, I will uh, say something more about uh, the interdisciplinary uh, endeavor that we have undertaken during the project period, because to work interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary or across disciplines or pluridisciplinary, there are so many words to define this kind of task, but it entails some very important uh, ethical considerations. Uh, but first of all, it entails fear. And I think the fear I'm talking about is the fear to demonstrate your own ignorance. Uh, because scho as scholars, we like to be knowledgeable and we like to uh, be uh, on the top of, uh, of our subjects. But when a scholar like me, who is specializing in the study of religion and Islam, work together with specialists of pietism or reform uh, scholars, reform reformist scholars, then I just have to see, okay, uh, I, I, you have some keys, some really underlying understandings that you just know. This is part of your discipline and I don't know them. So I have to be able to demonstrate, oh, I'm ignorant. I'm actually an ignorant scholar. And I think this kind of endeavor uh, for interdisciplinary um, or this kind of feeling when you're working interdisciplinary, you have to acknowledge it. But then the reward of course, is that you have an extremely steep learning curve when you are working together with specialists. 
uh, in different fields. So you learn a lot in one conference. You can learn about the Moravians, about pietism, about uh, core subjects uh, in the fields of your colleagues. And that is indeed uh, a reward. Uh, so the fact that you work across uh, disciplines, it's rewarding and it's uh, challenging. I think another thing that I wanted to say is that when we chose to work with the concept code, it enabled us to, uh, to invite a lot of different scholars into the project, uh, which means that we have learned uh, from people from different universities, different disciplines, uh, different countries, different parts of the world, who all have different connections to Jerusalem and also to their uh, material on which they have been working. And this may, made us understand a lot more about how we can look at Jerusalem reception in Scandinavia, because we work with scholars coming from Jerusalem or coming from the Middle East or coming from, uh, from uh, America. And I think that kind of, uh, of um, work make you a little bit humble, but it also enlarges your own perspective. perspective. So that was important uh, for me, at least. Uh, of course, one of the great challenges we actually met while working interdisciplinary is that you come from a certain discipline and you have some kind of political correctness, uh, which is attached to your discipline. Uh, so I'll take one, one example. Uh, it was when we discussed, could we use the Orientalist Congress in Stockholm and Oslo in 1889 as a kind of entry into the third volume of the Tracing the Jerusalem Code project? Uh, what does Orientalism have to do with Jerusalem and Scandinavia? You see with Jerusalem receptions here. And for me, uh, coming from uh, comparative literature and uh, the study of religion slash cultural history, it was not, it was just not thinkable not to, 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 to talk about Orientalism or post-colonial theory or, um, yes, the, the whole Saidian complex. I just had to ha have it into a book which is about the 19th century and about Jerusalem. Everything else would not be correct from my discipline. Uh, whereas for I would, for, for example, who is a church historian, it was not that significant. So we, we had really interesting discussions about these kind of, of problems. And in the end, it was the editor who decided. This is how <laughs> interdisciplinary works also, also is done. Uh, so I think uh, what my, my experience from this endeavor is that it has been overwhelmingly positive. I think I've never learned so much in three, four years that I learned during our work with the, with the project. So I would, do you want to say more about the relevance? Yeah, perhaps, but I think the time is gone. But if I still have one or two minutes, I can try to say something um, because we have, of course, thoughts about what is the relevance of the project to the contemporary society. And I would like to point to at least one thing, which is that we live in a society today which is going through a rapid process of secularization and where what we have called the Jerusalem Code, or in other words, this intrinsic structure, the spine, so to speak, of the Christian culture, as well as all these references we have traced, which have been transmitted and internalized through generations. They are about to be forgotten. And those of us who works with students knows how rapid this process has gone and is going. It's almost none of our students who know today what the Good Samaritan is, for example. Uh, these are references which were fundamental to previous generations and to our culture. So when we have traced both these references as well as the story world um, they belong to, we have given a map to this culture which today is fragmented and about to change into something else. 
So uh, when we trace the Jerusalem code as central, as a central structure of the Christian culture and points to the fragmentation of the structure, it uh, opens up new questions. What are the new deep structures of society today? And which stories and story world supplies our modern society? And how is the deep structure of the society transformed? And so uh, the message is that you need to know the past to understand the future. And in this sense, I think this is a very humanistic project in trying to answer some of the great questions important for both individuals and society today. Where do we come from and where do we go? And I don't think I have any more time, but um, we uh, think, of course, that this project has a relevance of um, to show how Christianity has changed for a long time span and how it's still changing. And it has to do with uh, how it relates to its starting point, which was the Jewish religion and the worship of God in the Holy Land with the temple in Jerusalem as the center. So it says a lot of how, about how different um, individuals and societies throughout history have related to Jerusalem as a concrete geographical uh, point or place and to this um, con Jerusalem concept. And it gives a very important background to understand both uh, religion and politics also today, how, how it relates to Jerusalem and different attitudes to Jerusalem and the Holy Land. So I think it's very relevant, both for religious and politics. 